Hi there, and welcome to the Grief and Rebirth podcast. I'm your host, author and trauma survivor, Irene Weinberg, here to encourage you wherever you are in your healing journey. In each episode, I chat with incredible grief and trauma specialists, healers, mediums, and celebs, as well as remarkable people who have inspiring healing stories to share. If you're looking for a podcast that's both uplifting and inspiring, you've found it. Let us help you find your joy in life. Hi, everyone. I hope this finds each of you so very well. I'm speaking to you from my studio in West Orange, New Jersey, and I'm absolutely delighted to have the pleasure of interviewing Sadie Bale, a spiritual grief guide who is the founder of the inspiring and uplifting From Morning to Light Grief Summits. Sadie's mission is to help others navigate their dark period of grief with grace, light, love, and hope. And full disclosure, I had both the honor and the pleasure of being invited to be a featured guest speaker at one of Sadie's recent From Morning to Light Grief Summits. Sadie is an admirable role model for grief to healing to transformation and rebirth. Before becoming a spiritual grief guide, Sadie was a professional architect who ran a small practice in Cape Town, South Africa, with her architect husband, Paul Bale. While married to Paul, she explored her secret passion, spirituality, by attending meditation, Reiki, and energy healing classes, learning to read angel cards, reading esoteric books, participating in breathwork sessions, and more, so that when Paul died suddenly, in a motorcycle accident in 2019, Sadie was already equipped with a spiritual arsenal of tools that helped her heal and embrace her life again. It was during that profound spiritual journey that Source opened up another path for Sadie, which prompted her to sell her car, pack a suitcase, move to Italy, remarry, and begin her work as a spiritual grief guide. I'm looking forward to talking with Sadie, who will be speaking to us from Pachenko, Pachentro, Sadie, Pachentro, Italy, about the amazing events that led up to Paul's motorcycle accident, the incredible sign Paul gave Sadie the very first morning after he died, her belief that the grief journey can become a powerful spiritual awakening, the tools in her spiritual toolbox that assisted Sadie during her grief journey, how true acceptance can free a person from being a victim and more for what is surely going to be an enlightening and heartwarming interview with a very special woman who is truly a joy to know. Hi, Sadie, a warm, loving welcome to Grief and Rebirth podcast. It's such a pleasure to have you here. Oh, hi, Irene. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm very, very excited. Oh, I think it's, it was so exciting for me to be on your summit. So it, it, it just, it turned about as fair play. Now I get to share you with my audience. So that it's really um, a wonderful thing. So let's begin with this question, because your whole life completely transformed. So can you tell us about your relationship with Paul? And share the amazing events that led up to his motorcycle accident. How long were you married to him, by the way, before when all this happened? That's a good question. (laughs) (laughs) How long were we married for? We lived together for many years before we got married. So I have to work it out. It's easy to work out. I was just curious. 20, 20 years. Wow. Okay. Wow. Okay, so could you tell us about your relationship with him and what happened? What were the amazing events that led up to the accident? Sure. Well, oh, it started with um, he and I loved running um, half marathons. And he went off to run a, a famous gun run. It's called the Gun Run in Cape Town. 
And I decided not to run this particular one because I was suffering a bit from perimenopause and I was feeling a little bit overweight and wasn't that fit. So off he goes and I get that call nobody ever wants to get, Irene, where someone says, are you the next of kin? Oh, my God. Are you the next of kin of Paul Bell? And I said to the person, it was a paramedic, I said to him, you can't start a conversation like that. Is he okay? And the, he couldn't tell me. He wouldn't tell me. He said, come here to the hospital as quickly as you can. Ooh. And I didn't have a car. Paul had taken the car because we were avid motorcyclists. So I said to him, I have to climb on a motorcycle now, and I need to have my wits about me. Tell me if he's okay. And he said, get your neighbor to drive you. Oh, my God. So I knew it was really, really serious, Irene. So I, we get to the hospital, and he's alive, but he's in a coma. And Paul had suffered a massive cardiac arrest while he was running. And one thing led to another, and they, the doctors eventually described that he'd had a secret heart attack before. And they call it a secret heart attack because you don't know what it is. The doctor said, did he suffer from heartburn? So I said, oh, there was a period where he did for several days have severe heartburn. I even said to him, would you like to see the doctor? And he said, it's heartburn, I'm fine. Oh. But it was actually um, a, a partial cardiac arrest. The doctor said it was an electrical fault that it caused his heart to just stop suddenly. It beat very quickly and then it stopped. And they said they would like to put a device into his chest um, so after he came around, he was out for four days. When he came around, he had pneumonia. So he had to recover from the pneumonia, and then they put the device in his heart. So he went off to run a half marathon, this fit man, and he came back thin, haggard, because pneumonia knocks the stuffing out of you, let alone a major cardiac arrest. And the doctors actually said, he it's amazing he's still alive. It's a miracle. It's an absolute miracle. So I want to tell you about these miracles because they really tie into what happened afterwards. Please do. When he dropped down, I later discovered there were four doctors around him, immediately around him. Irene, what are the odds? And they were right there and they resuscitated him. And that's the reason he survived because it was an organized race and there was an ambulance on hand. So they took him immediately. There were paramedics. Um, so I asked the organizer of the race for the names of the doctors and he gave me one name of an anesthetist. I think it was the second, it was the, the first day after Paul had been in the hospital, I messaged, I called the doctor, but he didn't reply. So I thought, oh, well, he's a doctor. He's obviously busy with whatever doctors do. So I sent him a message and I, it was a long message. I explained Paul's condition about the secret heart attack he'd had, the whole thing. And I said, thank you for saving Paul's life. And I sent the message, and I didn't get a reply. But it was sort of in the back of my mind, um, but I, I didn't send another message. And then a day later, I get a message back from the doctor saying, it's ironic that you're thanking me for saving Paul's life when Paul has actually saved my life. Wow. Oh. And and he said, I'm lying here in hospital. He said, what happened was after I resuscitated Paul, I decided not to continue on running. It Paul dropped in the middle of a 21-kilometer race, so around the 14, 10, 11, 12 kilometer. I'm not sure exactly where. So he decided, I'm, I'm not feeling great. I'm 
I'm going to go home now. He said, and then when I received your message, it started me thinking about my symptoms. So I called my doctor and he said, um, come in for some tests. So he went in, his his cardiologist did some tests on him and said, I'd like to do some more tests. Could you come back tomorrow? We want to do additional tests. He said when he got home that night, the symptoms flared up again and he knew what it was. So he jumped in his car. He said the hospital was very close to his home and he raced over to the hospital. Wow. And he he says that your message and not finishing the race, all of these things actually saved my life. How much after so so Paul revived, he had a he had, I guess it was a pacemaker or whatever they put in his heart. He races again. Now when did he die? When did he pass? How did that come about? Okay, so so it all ties in, Irene. It's just incredible. You know, when you look back and you put all the pieces, it's of like the a choreography in a way, right? It's like when you were doing the washing up, you forgot that you had that message that right. said Saul is going to die. You right. forgot, right? And right. so, so where were we? Okay, so we are sitting in our office doing our architecture work and I looked at Paul and I just said to him you were dead you were dead and now you're alive what is it you want to do with your one wild and precious life and that's a line from a Mary Oliver poem that I the summer day summer's day that I absolutely love and he said, I'd like to go to Italy and guide motorcycle tours. Wow. So I'd like to pack up architecture and just move to Italy because we loved Italy. We came here all the time on holiday. We were just obsessed with all things Italian. Even our motorcycles were Italian. <laughs> so I said, that's what we'll do. So we closed all our projects. We handed them over. We told everyone we were going. We sold all our furniture. We we packed everything. I mean, we were down to a mattress on the floor and deciding which documents were essential for us to bring with. That's what we were down to. We were three days away from flying to Italy to start. We had people booked for the motorcycle tours. We we had two tours we'd put online, and the second one, a big group of women wanted to do the second tour with us. Wow. So we people had paid deposits. I mean, Irene, it was happening. Wow. And, wow. and Paul didn't want to sell his motorcycle. He wanted to store it at a friend's house. And then once we were settled in Italy, he wanted to ship it over. And so he was on the motorcycle. I was following in the car behind. And he went to put in fuel. And we're driving along this most beautiful road in Cape Town that goes right along the beach. So there's a nature reserve, the road, the beach, and the sea. Big waves rolling in. It's the Atlantic. It's so beautiful. Sounds beautiful. And Paul went past me on the motorcycle. He'd filled in with fuel, and he was a lot quicker than the car. The cycle, motorcycle can weave between the traffic. And he waved, and I waved at him, and he passed me, and I started to cry. I just got this well of sadness, and I just cried. And I thought, where is this coming from? I I know I'm sad to leave Cape Town, but I'm not that sad. I'm more excited about going towards this new exciting life that we're planning. And and eventually this the tears stopped and the road went inland away from the sea towards the, the winelands. And as I'm going along, I see a motorcycle's down and I think oh, Oh no, there's a motorcycle down because being motorcyclists, you're always very aware. And I'm I'm getting ready to 
send white light, send good energy to this person. And then I realize it's Paul. Oh, my goodness. Like in all of this, you know, you know how quick your thoughts are. And I just pulled my car over, jumped out of my car. And I'd love to say I rushed over and performed CPR. No, Irene, I, it's as if someone shut my brain off and I just ran around in a circle going, oh, my You're God. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. I just, it just couldn't, com you know, compute. <laughs> And I saw a man standing next to a white truck, and he was going, it's all my fault. It's all my fault. So what had happened, he'd suddenly changed direction on this major road, and Paul had T-boned him. And I knew Paul was dead, Irene. I'd arrived at that scene, and I just knew. And... Suddenly I heard Paul breathe. He took in such a deep breath as if he'd been underwater. And I ran over to him and I realized his cardiac device had shocked his heart into animation again. And two ambulance rides and two hospitals later, the young doctor came out and he said, I'm so sorry, your husband's injuries are too severe. He didn't make it. And so that's, I'm so sorry, Sadie, and I've had the same experience. I lost all through a car accident, right? So mm -hmm. uh, though we both didn't lose them, they're on the other side, but still it's, it's such a shock, my goodness. So why do you say that the grief journey can become a powerful spiritual awakening when a person becomes aware. Because now you go into grief over Paul. Were you, did you continue on to Italy with this? Did you, or everything stayed still, now you came back to Cape Town? What, what were you? No, I couldn't. I was in no state. I was in such shock, Irene, that I felt like I was a meter up in the air. I felt like my feet wouldn't touch the ground when I walked. I I had to stamp my feet to feel the ground. It, it, I was in tremendous shock. 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 Yeah. So you went so the, that night you slept back in Cape Town. My my very good friend stayed with me at the hospital. So Paul they announced Paul dead at 17 minutes past three in the morning. And um my friend hugged me and he said to me, breathe, said he breathe, because I stopped breathing. And he had to say it several times, Irene. And I realized why I did that is I, I wanted time to stop. I felt if I held my breath, I could stop time because time was taking me further away from Paul the last time I'd seen him, the last time I'd spoken to him. In fact, this was a theme that carried on for a good few days after Paula died. I, I, I wanted time to stop. I was in a panic about it, Irene. I can understand that. So he, my friend um, and his wife are my best friends. Well, they were mine and Paul's best friends, and we were planning to go and stay with them for the last few nights before we flew out anyway. So he just took me home with him, and I stayed in their spare room for a few months. Now, wasn't there an incredible sign Paul gave you uh, the very first morning after he died? And then you've also received other signs from him, right? Yeah, incredible you want to tell sign. us about that? What, sure. what did he do? What, what, did he, what did he do that said to you, Sadie, I'm still here? Okay, so I go home with my friend in the early hours of the morning and I go into the spare room and I fell asleep. I didn't, I wasn't insomniac. I think I was just so emotionally exhausted. And as I was waking up, before I opened my eyes, I heard the clunk of a coffee cup on the bedside table. And I heard Paul's voice audibly say, Sade, which is how he woke me up every single morning, Irene. Oh. 
So he was right there. And when I opened my eyes, I was so confused because I wasn't in my bedroom. I was in my friend's spare room and then I came flooding back. But I was kind of going betwixt and between. I was right here, but he's died, but he was right here. <laughs> so that very first morning, Irene, I didn't wake up with the out pool. He was right there. He was right there. And have you received, you have received some other signs from him since he transitioned, haven't you? Loads of them. Loads can you tell us? Can you, uh, so the, for, our, for our audience, we're saying, what kind of signs can I look for for my loved one? What kinds of signs has Paul sent you? Okay, so, so the last sign I'm going to tell you about is, is based a lot on trust. And because I've done all of those spiritual modalities that you mentioned in your introduction, I was in my friend's house. I couldn't really cry because I didn't want to upset them. So every time I got in my car, I cried. And everyone said to me, you're in such shock, which was true. You need to see someone. So I went to see a psychotherapist. Now, Irene, I'm sure loads of people are helped by psychotherapists. I'm not knocking them at all, but it did nothing for me. My grief wasn't in my mind. It was in my body. And so I decided I'd try Reiki. So I go off to somebody for Reiki, and I'm lying there. It's a freezing cold day, and she's got these lovely, soft, fluffy blankets, and she tucks me up. It was so maternal and motherly. And she puts this is what you needed, by the way, exactly what you needed. Exactly. She puts these beautiful crystals on me, and I just start crying. I think I cried for a half, an hour and a half for the whole Reiki session. And while she's doing the Reiki, she says, Paul's guides are here. So I went, oh, and she says, they've got a message for you. They're saying, did Paul give you a book of poems? And I love poetry. And yes, he did. He gave me a beautiful called Best book of best poems in fact it's behind me it's this blue one here on my uh -huh. bookshelf and um she said there's a poem in there called how do i love thee let me count the ways oh and paul says that poems for you go and look it up go and read it that's what his guides are saying so the Reiki session ends, and um, we have a little chat afterwards, and she says, Sadie, I've never channeled anything or anyone in my life, let alone a dead person's guides. <laughs> I just want to let you know. So I don't know where that came from. So I said, okay, but, you know, he did give me a book of poems. I'm going to go look the poem up. Cup of coffee in the book of poems, Sadie. He was setting you <laughs> up for the for your activities the next day. <laughs> so I'm still living with my friends, and um, he's a good cook, a very good cook. So we sit in the kitchen while he cooks, and I tell him the story, and he pours us a nice glass of red wine, and he and his wife are journalists, so they rush off to get their respective books of poems because I don't have anything on me, Irene. The very few items that were left in the house were packed into boxes and actually were with my friend we were going to leave the motorcycle with. So I don't have my book. They come back, we read the poem, we cry together because it's such a beautiful poem. And... If, I think a few weeks later, I go to that friend's house where my box is and I rummage around and I go and get this book. And it it comes with a ribbon that you can mark your place. It's fixed into the book. And I'm flipping through the book and I get to where the ribbon is marking. It's that poem. Why am I not surprised? <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. I, just, I like almost screamed. It was just. Another confirmation to trust, trust, yes. 
This is from Paul. So in your way, with all that you knew about these healing modalities and all, your grief journey became a spiritual awakening for you. Would you say? It, on a deeper level than it had been before. I thought I was spiritually awake, but but it really tested my my intuition. It tested my faith. It tested my belief that Paul really, really is still there and watching over me. And then there were so many other signs. Well, you want so, to give us one or two others? Do you have any sure. others? Tell us. Sure. So, so finally... I wake up one morning and I decide I need to do something with my life. I can't live in my friend's spare room. I don't have a job, Irene. I don't have a home. I don't have a husband anymore. I don't. All I have is a car. And I'm just thinking, well, what am I going to do? And I start to think, okay, I could go work for an architect. I've got a lot of friends. I could just go and join somebody in Cape Town. And then I could get a flat, I suppose, and then buy furniture. And then I was just thinking, it's not appealing. I, I can't go backwards. I can't. In fact, it just, it repelled me. It was not something I was excited to do at all. And then I thought, well, I could go to Italy. And, and it was almost shocking. I was like, <gasps> could I? Could I? <laughs> <laughs> but I knew I couldn't guide motorcycle tours, not on my own, Irene. I, I couldn't climb back onto my motorcycle after that. I, could, I just You couldn't. know, I just want to interject, Sadie, because Saul and I were skiers. And um, we skied all over Europe and we skied all over the United States and all. And it was a very much a part of our lives. And after the accident, we were we had been coming home from a ski weekend. I never skied again. I could mm -hmm. not. It was so, so, I always called skiing what I did for love with Saul. And because I originally came from Florida, I wasn't a skier and I took to it to be with him. And then once mm -hmm. the our accident happened, that was it for me also. I, I took to motorcycling because of Paul. Yeah. Right. yeah. There you go. There you go. So, but you decided to go to Italy. I decided I'll go and see. I thought, because we had a holiday home here. So I thought, well, I'll just, I'll go traveling. I, my family is in London. So we, I, I felt I needed to see my family. And then I thought I'll go to Italy and I'll just see. So I did that. I went to London. I had a lovely Christmas there. I came to Italy and I found a kitten. I... I was Paul and our door cats. So I was walking through the lane. There was this tiny kitten, and the stray cats are very scared of you. They don't come up to you. And little boy was stroking this little kitten. So I thought, oh, I wonder if it'll let me stroke it. And I went up to the kitten. The father had yanked the boy away and said, the kitten is dirty. And I went up to the kitten and it just, I had a scarf on and it climbed up the scarf and snuggled in my scarf. Oh, my goodness. And it was dirty and thin. And I thought, okay, okay. And I started crying because I knew it was another sign from Paul. Because that was on the first day I arrived. Wow, and wow, wow. So I thought back and I thought, Paul knew if I got a cat, I would stay. What did you name the cat? Jasmine. Jasmine. Pretty. And didn't you have experience with a neighbor and roses that in the oh, midst of your grief? Yes. You want to tell us about yes. that? That's an amazing story, Sadie. Thanks, Irene. So, so before I started to think, what am I going to do with my life, I, I felt very lost and very shocked. And there's a beautiful farm in Cape Town called Chart Farm, and they grow roses. They just have this hillside covered in different colored roses, and you can go and pick them. And it's such a beautiful place. That's Paul beautiful. and I went there. It is. It's stunning with views of the mountains, and you can go and have tea there. So I thought, one day I was feeling really down, and I thought, 
I know, I'll go to Chart Farm and have tea and I'll pick roses. That'll make me feel better. <laughs> so I get to Chart Farm and I have to tell you, I cried every single day. I get in my of car course. and just cry and got to Chart Farm and cried. And of then course. took the basket and the secateurs and I wandered through the roses crying. <laughs> Cutting the roses and smelling them, and I, I just I cut so many roses, Irene. I cut far too many roses, so I thought that's okay. I'll just tie them into different bundles and I'll give them away. And across the road from where I was staying was a lady I hadn't really met her or spoken to her, but she lost her husband a few months before Paula died. And she had children, so that's why I hadn't really met her. We just, you know, said hello in passing because she was very busy and also dealing with her grief. But I thought I'll go. So I gave roses to the lady I was staying with, my very good friend. And then I thought I'll go across the road and I'll just go give her a bunch of roses because, you know, we're in this together and... So I knock on her door and I chose some beautiful, six beautiful roses and I, I gave them to her. And she counted them in the instant and she burst into tears and she said, today marks the day six months ago that my husband died. And here you are on my doorstep bringing me roses, six roses. Wow. And then we had tea together and we both cried. <laughs> <laughs> as one does. <laughs> but as you were getting messages from Paul, you brought her you brought her light and a message from her husband. How beautiful. You know, say this wonderful. And you went through and you talk about it, about how the death of a loved one causes this dark or can cause this dark night of the soul, which you were going through, which I've gone through. And then it opens us up to big questions, which it, as you opened up spiritually, you started to discover the answers to some of these questions. What happens when we die? Where has my loved one actually gone? Why are we here? What is the meaning of life? How can I ever feel happy again? So have you discovered the answers to any of these questions? And since you've been opening up spiritually, you've had this awakening, would you like to enlighten some of us about that? Sure, Irene, sure. There's one story that illustrates this really, really well. So again, deep in my grief, I got to the point where I didn't want to live anymore without Paul. I just, what is the meaning? You know, life had lost its meaning for me. I didn't have a home, as I said. I didn't have a job. I lost my best friend, my partner, my everything. And I, I just thought, so well, I just thought, well, I'm just... I have no purpose. <laughs> There's no reason for me to be here. And, and I'll probably be better off just joining him. And I was alone again on the beach, and it was quite deserted. And I thought, you know, I could just walk into the sea and just keep walking. No one would oh. really notice. And then I, I'll just go. You know, I'll just go under and, you know, maybe they'll find me. Maybe they won't. It doesn't matter. I I really, really was wow. seriously contemplating that, Irene. Even though I w was spiritually aware and all of that, I just felt that I didn't want to be here anymore. Yeah. And I strongly, strongly felt I would never be happy again. I just, I couldn't conceive of anything that would light me up. It just wasn't there. And then what happened? I just, I didn't do it though. I didn't walk into the sea. And then I caught myself and I thought, well, you know, you really need to shake this mood. What would cheer you up? I thought, ice cream, I love ice cream. I absolutely, being in Italy with all the gelato here, I'm in my, I'm in heaven. And they, they, I'd seen a little ice cream shop, so I thought, 
I'll go and get an ice cream and eat an ice cream. That might do the trick. And I walk into the ice cream shop. And I didn't say anything. I just ordered an ice cream from this very young, vibrant guy behind the counter. He was just full of life, full of beans. And he said to me, Madam, would you like a small, a medium, or a large? I just asked for a vanilla soft serve. So I said, oh, just a small one, thanks. And he winked at me, and he proceeded to, you know, they've got those machines. He created the largest vanilla soft serve oh ice cream goodness. I've ever seen in my life. Oh, my goodness. And he took a stick of chocolate, it's soft, flaky chocolate, and he stuck it in, and he said, Here's your small ice cream, madam. And he charged me for a small. And I said, that's the biggest small I've ever seen in my life. And he winked at me again. And I walked outside and I thought, what just happened? Energetically, he must have known, I realized. He just... But he lifted my mood so much. He was so generous. He was so winky and full of fun. And I, it shifted my mood completely, Irene. So what would uh, you say? So they told you that it, what was the message you got from that? What, what did you learn from that? That I'm being watched over. And then I trusted that Paul was doing whatever he could behind the scenes to make sure I was okay. And I realized, and then I went for a walk in nature the next morning and I sat on top of the hill crying again. And, and I said to him, um, I just, I'm never going to see you again. And, and his voice audibly came and he said, that's not true. Wow, wow, wow. He said, we will see each other again. Because you are going to die, but not now. What a wonderful message, though, in a way, because that sustains me also, because I know I will see Saul again, too. What yeah. would you say you had so many tools in your spiritual toolbox? What are what specific tools would you say helped you the most in your grief journey to help you to begin to heal? Well, the first one was the awareness that the Reiki would help, and it did. Irene, it really it helped me release my emotions. I went for several sessions. I got loads of messages from Paul's guides, and and those two things. And because I was spiritual and I trusted his guides were coming through this lady, that helped me tremendously. Um, the other thing I did was meditation. I've always meditated, and it since oh, I've been doing it for many, many years, and it's it's a habit. Is it a and guided it, meditation, Sadie, or you just close your eyes and see what comes to you? Um, it depends on my mood. If I find my mind is too distracted, I'll I'll find a guided meditation. Um. But I can do transcendental meditation. I can just sit quietly and breathe. And I've practiced a lot of breath work. So I, if if my energy is very low, I'll practice breath work to bring my vibration up. Um, some days I would do EFT tapping to just bring me back to some kind of operating normal. I, I want to hesitate to advise people about these things because if you not practiced in doing them, you may be tempted to use them so that you avoid feeling your emotions. And that's not a good thing, Irene, because the the first thing I promised myself is that I would cry when I want to cry. Absolutely. I wasn't going to swallow my tears down. I wasn't going to pretend I wasn't sad. I promised myself that I would express my emotions and get them out because I know energetically, and I'd studied this, is if you don't, it will create imbalances energetically, dis-ease within your energetic bodies and eventually disease. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it can literally make you ill. Wow. Now, you have 
healed so much and now you help other people and i know you connect with angels and archangels through angel card readings you and you have guided past life regression sessions tell us about that sadie now you're now you're paying it forward you're passing it forward to help others in their grief right so yeah um if someone wants to reach out to you for an angel reading an angel card reading or a past life regression session do you want to tell us about that uh sure. and what you do Sure. So, I mean, it happened by accident. So, I was doing a Tony Robbins um, Unleash the Power Within while I was here in Italy because it was COVID. I couldn't go anywhere. I couldn't practice architecture. I couldn't leave my house to go to an interview to find a job. So, I was just online, as most people were. And I decided that I could use my spiritual gifts to help people. I hadn't thought of that before. I, I was on the focus of let me climb back into architecture again. So I started to do angel card readings for people because they, they're an easy way to help people. It's not you telling people what to do. It's coming from the angels which is easier to hear. And also those little guidebooks. I mean, people have channeled that information already. So it's beautifully gently written. So you're saying things very in a very kind way. So now, is it those people's angels coming through or are there angels you're working with when you do the angel card reading? Well, well, I use other people's cards. So the book's already written. I get messages from my guides while I'm wow. with this person. They put things in my head. So so something will come up and then I'll say, you know, I'm, I'm getting a message about this. For example, one woman, for example, who ha had fallen and hurt herself. She couldn't get out of bed because she was immobile now. And I, I said to her, I just I keep getting this message that you – you are immobilized. And she said, yes, my car's broken. <laughs> so she couldn't even, ha was she able to walk? She couldn't get in her car and go anywhere wow. anyway. And, and I said to her, I'm just getting this message. You, you are immobilized, but it's for a reason. And then we went through the cards to figure, to figure out why. And then another client, we... We went through the cards and I said to her, this situation's coming up. Has it ever come up in your childhood before? Because it, it looked like something she really needed to clear. And she said, no. I said, are you sure? Because generally, the when you're in grief, all your unresolved trauma comes to the surface to be dealt with. Irene, you know that. Yeah. And so I said to her, did something traumatic happen in your childhood? I could see by her face, genuinely nothing had. I got that voice in my head. It said, past life. Uh -huh. I, said, I said to my head, are you sure? <laughs> 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 my guides. So I said to my client, look, they're telling me it's a past life issue. And I can regress you, but I've never done it before are you open to trying it and she said sure so we did it and we discovered did you, what... did you put her in a hypnotic situation and you knew how to do that yes and so so with the past life regressions is she's in total control or whoever goes like i guide them to go and discover ask you know show me why why is this happening show me so the person gets taken to the correct past life that is directly linked to this life so that they can get the connection. And then they see it. I can't see it. But my guides are continually guiding me. So I'm asking them, what do you see now? What's happening? And then my guides are saying, ask this, ask that. With this one lady, she, she'd had an affair and become pregnant by a man she wasn't married to in a time when it wasn't acceptable and she was shunned by society. And my oh, guys were saying, my guys were saying to me, whore, whore, 
for. So I said to her, are people, you know, shaming you about this? Are they calling you a whore? And 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 it's it's a strong thing to say, but it but it invoked the emotion in her for her to go there emotionally. So it was almost like a shock thing. But I I would only do it if my guides guide me to do that. I would never do it, you know, to hurt someone. But it it really helped her resolve this pattern in her life. Wow, that she, that's so amazing. She's broken it now. Right, right. So you do this for a lot of people, it sounds like. And you also talk about the fact that true acceptance can free a person from being the victim in the movie of their life story. That is very profound, Sadie. Would you like to tell us a little more about about that? Sure. So while I was living in my friend's house and before I came to Italy, I decided I needed a road trip. I needed to get out of the house I needed to be really, really by myself and just really come to grips because I think my grief was really strong at that time and I was feeling very sorry for myself, Irene. Really, I was. And in the Reiki session, Paul's guides had said, go to the forests, you'll meet someone who will help you. So late at night, in grief, I just booked a cabin on Airbnb, <laughs> packed a little suitcase, got in my car, and off I went on a road trip to the forests, the Nisner forests and the wilderness. You are a brave I, lady. You are, that was, that's very <laughs> courageous, <just> Sadie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I did a lot of crying, though. So but, I get to the wilderness. <laughs> And I'm staying in this B&B, and the lady lets me in, and I meet her, and we have a little chat. And then we keep bumping into each other because the B&B is on her property. Now, this was and this was at the time in Cape Town, or this, right, was this was still in Cape Town? Just, right? just before I decided to move to Italy. So I bumped into her the one day, and she said, um, come and – have dinner with me and then the the next night I went there and she was very very ill and she said she had flu very bad influenza and she said I'm so sorry I can't cook for you so I said well I'll cook why don't you lie on the couch? To do this? you weren't worried about getting her flu or anything no she I said to you stay on this on the couch well and your blankets it was winter I said, I'll cook. And then we started chatting. And she brought me, she told me her husband had died five years earlier. And she told me about her life. And it was so full, Irene. She had all of these things that she was doing, all of these young people she was guiding in youth groups and friends and trips she had planned and she wanted to build a food forest. I mean, she was just full of life. She was still grieving her husband. She still missed him tremendously, but she was living her life. And at one point I said that to her, I said, I, I just, I'm so glad I can see that you are where you are five years down the line. It gives me hope that maybe I could be there too. And she said, you can choose to be a victim in the movie of your life, or you can choose to be the heroine. That is very profound. That is and very she, profound. It is. She'd um, guided and counseled young ladies who'd been raped. Oh. So she had a whole arsenal of tools and she would say to those young ladies, you can see this as the worst thing that's ever happened to you and you're never going to be okay again. Or it can empower you to help others in this situation. Well, that's wonderful. Very and wise. So, so she's the one who got me there. And again, through Paul. Through Paul and you didn't even know her and here this kind of angelic woman comes into your life. You know, and so now what led you, now you get to Italy and you start doing these uplifting from morning to light brief summits. Do you want to tell us about that, Sadie? What started this? You, How come you, you choose 21 guest speakers 
How do you choose them? Tell us all about that. Because you've created your own compassion space to support people. Okay, so it happened with the Tony Robbins Unleash the Power Within. You do a little exercise where you it's it's a hierarchy of needs and what drives you to do what you do. And so I had this, I did the exercise and I had a distinct split. I had this Sadie before Paul died priority list. And the Sadie after Paul had died priority list. And the Sadie after Paul had died had this huge, open, compassionate heart. Not that I wasn't a compassionate person before, Irene, but not on this level. And and it just hit home to me that I really, I need, I've got the tools. I need to help people. And And it became such a spiritual moment that I got a message from Paul that it's part of the journey. That's why he went first, because I'm meant to do this. I can so I got... relate. I can so relate. Our stories are so similar. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. And so I, it, it was quite a watershed moment. And it gave such a depth of meaning to Paul's passing. And then I realized I need an audience. And then I discovered that there was this lady training people on how to put events on. And I thought, I don't know, a light bulb just went on. And I thought, that's it. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do an event on grief. So the training is 21 speakers, which is a magical number. I love the number. And they train you to just go and look for people. So wow. I... So I took my compassionate, scared heart in my hands and I contacted people. I sent them an email. I said, would you be interested in appearing in a grief summit? Thinking they're all going to say no because I am nobody. Nobody knows who I am. I'm not anything in the grief space. And all of these people are so important. They've written books and they have podcasts. <laughs> But everyone was so kind, Irene, everyone. Everyone I contacted said, what a wonderful thing you're doing, Sadie. Yes, we'd love to be on your event. And and it surprised the socks off me. How many people just said, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> How wonderful of it. And I was one of them. <laughs> so I, it was wonderful. And you've done four of these now, right? Yes. And you have, you're, are you planning a fifth? Yes, I am. You want to tell I us am. about that? Sure, Irene. I have a business partner. Her name's Emily Thoreau-Threat, and she was a guest, and we just really clicked. So we did the fourth event in at the beginning of the year, around April, together, and she's part of the Grief and Happiness Nonprofit Alliance. So... She um, chooses 10 speakers and I choose 10. And maybe we'll have another one. We'll see how it all pans out. And we interview the people that we choose and then we put it all together. And it's worked really well. So we're doing another one. It's coming out in October. How wonderful. And I was honored to be part of the one you had in April. It was just lovely. Now, you also have 10 week, and, and we'll provide links so that people can get all the information about them uh, from the I, show notes and all. What else would you like to say, Sandy? No, I just wanted to add that the event is free. That's important so to know, too. The event is free because we want, both Emily and I want to reach as many people as we can, like you do with your podcast emily also has a podcast the event is free but there's a vip upgrade that you pay for where you receive and keep all of the recordings so and all of the proceeds of that goes to the grief and happiness non-profit alliance so so it's all for a good cause. It's all it's all connected, just like we all are. And you also have a 10-week transformation workshop. You have guided meditations for inner peace. So tell us about those and any other offerings that you'd like to share 
with our Grief and Rebirth podcast audience. And I'd love to hear uh, one or two examples of how your transformation workshops have helped people. Sure. Sure, Irene. Okay, so the transformation workshop is for people who come to that stage of their grief where they feel they haven't really resolved it. There's still things that are coming up, their past trauma, but they don't even know that. They just feel that they're not getting on with their lives. I've also helped people who've gone through divorce, which is a similar, it's grief. It's a death it's in a lot grief. of ways. It's grief, absolutely. And um, I meet them where they are, so it's a one-on-one. -on -one. So if anyone's interested in working with me personally, there's a form on my website. Just send me an email and I'll set up a call and then we'll see if it's the right fit for you. The The transformation course, depending on where the person is, I start with angel cards and, and some people want them every single session. They want to know what the angels have to say. Um, sometimes we're guided to go to the past lives. Some I, I do a lot of guided um, resolution meditations with them. So if there are unresolved issues with the person who's passed on, then we go and meet them in a meditative state. And then they tell them what's unresolved and then they wait for their loved one to, to answer, to give them clarity or to give them closure. And it works, Irene. Everyone who's gone on this guided meditation gets resolution. Wow. And sometimes sometimes it's with the other family members. Sometimes it's not with the person who's passed on. Sometimes when the person who's passed on causes an, a very unhealthy dynamic in the family, a lot of fighting and misunderstanding, everyone's in grief. And then I help to resolve that too. It's marvelous. So now is this transformation workshop an individual thing or something that you do with a group of people? Is it, it's, it's an individual? At the moment, it's face-to-face -face transformation workshop. So you do it online with people like on Zoom or whatever? Yes. Okay, so that information will make sure that the links for all of that are with the show notes and all. And do you have at the top of your head an example of someone uh, your transformation workshop helped like a situation she came with and how that resolved. Is there any, either with death or divorce or whatever? There's one lady that comes to mind that was a surprise. She, she came because her husband passed away, but he wasn't with her. He was, he had a house that he was fixing up in another state and she, he, he was ill but he wasn't on death's door. He just had some issues. And then he went up to work on that house. He wasn't with her for the weekend. And then he he just lay down on a bench at the house in the garden, folded his hands over his chest, and, and they found him like that. Wow. And she was so angry because... He knew he was going to die because of the position he was in, almost like he just lay down to just go. So I think he had something in his aorta. I can't remember clearly now. It was a while ago. But this sticks with me that he must have felt something and he knew he was going to die and he didn't call her. He didn't call an ambulance. He just lay down and waited for death. She was so angry about that and she wanted resolution. She wanted to know why. Why would he do that? Why well, she felt abandoned. Me? I can understand that. She felt that he had abandoned her that way. Yeah. So, so how did you help her in your transformation workshop? So we went and did this meditation that I described where you go and she could say to him, you know, why didn't you call me? And I could clearly see the angels came to take him. He didn't have time. It's They came and they said, okay, it's your time. And he went, oh, okay. And he lay down and they took him. He, wow. didn't, he, he didn't have the presence of mind to call anyone 
but he knew it wouldn't have helped anyway. He he could have called an ambulance, but the angel said it's your time. We've right. come to take you. Wow. Did that give her a peace when you got that message? Tremendous peace. And then another piece on that is because it's 10 weeks, there were other issues that had come up, obviously. And one of the issues was she came on and she said, I didn't realize that I'm coping with my grief by drinking. Ooh. And she said, I, since we've had these sessions together, I've come to that awareness. I, I wouldn't have had that self-awareness without these sessions. And she bought a book on how to stop drinking, and she did. She oh, stopped drinking. That is truly a transformation, Sadie. How wonderful. And I want to also ask you, in that, in that vein, why do you believe it's important for each of us that we should do our healing work? And how do your your healing modalities encourage the release? Well, you're telling us how you help people release their trauma and stuck emotions, which helps the healing process. Why should, why should people not stay stuck in their healing and go through the pain to move through their grief and move forward? Have you got anything you'd like to share with our audience about that? Sadie. Sure. Um, I think society can be a bit harsh on people who are grieving. There's this idea that after a year, you should be over it. In fact, some people even have the time shorter than that. And so there's a lot of pressure on people who are grieving to be okay again when they really are not feeling okay, mm -hmm. Irene. That's, that's the sad thing about society. And Tied into that is a person who's grieving almost becomes angry and defiant about it. I'm in grief. Leave me alone. And the danger of that is you start to identify as a person who's in grief, who's in pain, who's never going to be happy again, which is exactly where we both were. We know mm -hmm. that feeling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when they come to the place where they could actually move forward, they're just too scared or they just don't have the self-awareness or they just don't take that leap of faith. So they don't, they're don't. seeing the signs, Irene, they're just not trusting them. They say to themselves, oh, I'm just imagining it. And they're closing themselves. They're closing oh. down. They're closing down, Irene. They're kind of choosing to suffer the rest of their lives, right? But it's a choice. It's like when I went to that woman in the woods, she said to me, you choose now. And and from that conversation, I decided, okay, maybe I can go to Italy. Right. So I, I can't emphasize enough, just get community around you. As Emily has this beautiful uh, meeting that happens every single week. So if you find my website, I link to hers and you can go meet with her. I've also, I've just launched a meditation group called the Zen Room. Oh, how and wonderful. It, it starts on Monday. Oh, my cat's coming through. Hi. <laughs> Figaro. This is oh, Figaro. Hello, Figaro. <laughs> Jasmine passed away, unfortunately. So, where was that? So, it's very important to find the people that you resonate with in grief. Not everyone's for you. Psychotherapists are not for me, but they might be the perfect thing for you. Just explore. My and, advice and, and, is go on Facebook, listen to podcasts, find your your group. Find right. your tribe. Well, many people are doing that by listening to us today. And what do you say? Why do you say that life doesn't have to be perfect to be wonderful? And how does that lead to joy? Okay. So I had a box in my closet that I put all my socks and pantyhose into. Otherwise, it's just a mess all over the show. And it had a quote from Marilyn Monroe on it. <laughs> Life doesn't have to be perfect 
to be wonderful. And it just feels so glamorous. I mean, Marilyn Monroe said it. And after Paul died, that stuck in my brain. So Paul isn't here anymore. Therefore, life isn't perfect. But it doesn't mean it can't be wonderful, Irene. And you're moving on. Look at all the people who you're helping. That's wonderful, Sadie. You know, Sadie, in closing, I want to thank you for all you do, and you do so much to help people find solace, wisdom, and support through both your healing work and your wonderful, truly healing from morning to light summits, which are helping so many people to navigate their grief journey with grace and love. And I also want to thank you, Sadie, from my heart for this insightful and enlightening interview on Grief and Rebirth podcast. And here is a loving reminder, everyone, that you can see the show notes and all Grief and Rebirth podcast episodes on IreneWeinberg.com. And make sure to follow us and like us on social at at Irene S. Weinberg on Instagram, Facebook, and wherever you get your podcasts, including YouTube. As I like to say, to be continued. Thank you from my heart, Sadie. Many blessings and bye for now.